we were going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are invariably right. Wow, how nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other for such a comparatively short time. Praise it down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? Oh, with pleasure. And you'll always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then it's all quite settled then. opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I'm glad to say, is almost entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home, to me, seems to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so terribly attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. Do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, no, no, Brendan. I'm quite fond of being looked at. You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no, I live here. Really? Some female relative of advanced Years, or your mother, no doubt, resides here also? Oh, no, I have no mother, or in fact, any relations. Indeed. Yes, my caretaker, with the help of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of taking care of me. Your caretaker? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Odd, Mr. Worthing never mentioned to me he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting, hourly. Though, I cannot say, however, that this news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. Now that I know that you are Mr. Mr. Worthing's ward, I am... Oh, I must say that I wish you were, well, not quite so young and alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Oh, pray do. I believe that when anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well... Then, to speak in perfect candor, I wish you were fully 42 and more than unusually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. <sighs> oh, this loyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. <sighs> However, even men of the noblest possible moral character are easily distracted by the alluringness of others. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my ward. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they haven't been on good terms for quite a while. Ah, that accounts for it. Now that I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Oh, Cecily Darling, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours. Would it not? And now you are quite quite certain it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite certain. In fact, I'm going to be his. <laughs> Pardon me. Dear Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. It is sure to our little county newspaper that is sure to chronicle the fact in next week's paper. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> and, my darling Cecily, there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The event will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday, at latest. But there must be some mistake. You see, Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. That is quite odd, considering that Mr. Ernest Worthing proposed to me, asking me to be his wife yesterday at 5.30. If you care to verify the incident, I do so.
and mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out the fact that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the foolish boy has gone himself into any foolish promise, I consider it my duty to rescue him, and with a firm hand. <laughs> well, let it be known that I will never recompend my Ernest with it after we are married. Are you referring to me as a sort of entanglement? Miss Carden, you are presumptuous. At times like these, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind, it becomes a pleasure. This is no time for the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I've never seen a spade. It is clear that our social sphere has been widely different. <laughs> yes, as usual, Mary Lynn. walks in the vicinity, Miss Carter? Yes, a great many. From one of the hills not far from here, one can see as many as five counties. Five counties? <laughs> I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. Oh, <laughs> that's how you live in London. <laughs> <laughs> what a very well-kept garden, Miss Cardew. I'm so glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I didn't know there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are quite common here. As people are in the city. <sighs> I don't understand how anybody exists in the country if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Oh, isn't that what the newspapers are calling a agricultural depression? It is almost an epidemic amongst the aristocracy, is it not? Would you like any tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Girl, that require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar's not fashionable anymore. <laughs> Bread and butter or cake? Bread and butter. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. sugar, and though I most distinctly ask for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the sweetness of my disposition and the extraordinary gentleness of my nature, but I warn you, Miss Carter, you may go too far. To save my poor butt from the entanglement of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I thought you were false and deceitful. <laughs> my first impressions of people are never wrong. <laughs> Maybe you should go on with your day, then, Miss Fairfax. It seems to me you have married very many other important calls to make in the neighborhood. <gasps> A gross deception has been